This is the On All Cylinders Podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Your host for today is Summit Racing's Justin Weideman with special guest Ed Bolian, founder and CEO of VinWiki. Here we go. What's going on, guys? It's Justin here with Summit Racing, and we have a very special guest for you guys. We have Ed Bolian from VinWiki, and I mean, you, you wear a lot of hats, so, uh, you know, VinWiki is just a small part of it, but thanks for joining us today, Ed, and how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. A rainy day here in Atlanta. Sounds like you got the same going on in Ohio, so... Uh... What better way to talk cars? We love to do that here at Summit Racing. So you have a really crazy, interesting story. You know, you've owned a, a car rental business. You started VinWiki. You worked at Lamborghini Atlanta. So let's start at the beginning. Working at Lamborghini Atlanta, what's it like to work at an exotic car dealership? To be honest, it's probably a lot more similar in how you be successful as working at your mom and pop Kia dealership, just because the fundamentals of car sales are so critical no matter what the price point is. But yeah, we were Lamborghini, Aston Martin, McLaren, Lotus, and Spiker for uh, franchises, and we sold used everything. And so I really, really enjoyed it. To be quite honest, I was leaving the exotic car rental industry. There was some overlap there, and they wanted me to come sell cars because I had a, a pretty strong understanding from the rental business of what the real incremental ownership costs look like for using and driving the cars that we all love. And so at the time when I started there, which was 2009, we were kind of at the bottom of the recession, and it was a really, really tough time to sell expensive and luxury assets, which was a challenge that I really enjoyed. We had a lot of fun, and I learned a lot. And I really wanted to know, like, do I want to go start my own dealership? Because, you know, a lot of the viewers of the VinWiki channel, a lot of people that follow me, that they're really interested in finding some way to be professional car people and whatever that means to them and their love of cars. And so what I always say is you want to find a way to sort of test drive that concept before you fully commit your life to it. And so uh, working at an exotic car dealership was the right way to learn the industry. Uh, certainly came away with a lot of stories to tell, but it also informed the idea that no, I do not want to be a lifer in the car dealership business because it's just one of those things where there is not an easy trade-off between quality of life and, and really you know owning and chasing the success that you want in the space. And so I had a great time there. I was there a little over five years and uh, then just kind of went out looking for the next adventure and that became VinWiki. So for the folks at home that aren't exactly familiar with the VinWiki app or, you know, the channel, can you explain how the VinWiki app works and um, what you use it for? Absolutely. So we started the VinWiki app in 2016. We started developing it in January. We launched it on mobile and web uh, summer, I think June of 2016. And then it wasn't actually until a year later that we started the YouTube channel that considerably more people recognize me from. But the app was designed based on a few things that I had done as a car enthusiast that I'd really, really kind of reaped the benefits of. And the first was that years and years ago, more than a decade ago now, I, on my personal website, which is edbolian.com, I made a list of all the VINs of all the cars that I'd ever owned so that whenever anybody Googled one of those VINs, they would find me. And so through that, I learned that the first Lamborghini from my rental car company had been exported somehow to Hong Kong, even though that's not legal. One of the Ferraris had been crashed. One of the Land Rovers got exported to Russia. One went to Puerto Rico. And I just thought that was really, really fascinating because we're, we're pretty good at understanding our own ownership of a car. We're okay sometimes at looking back on its history, but being able to zoom out even further and see what happens after we own the car, to me, was a really, really fascinating thing. And so I learned so many fun things that sort of enriched the no longer ownership of the car through that, that I felt like building a platform around not only documenting where your car's been, but what you did with it, and certainly looking into where it goes from there was really, really fun. The other thing that I had done is that my personal favorite car is a manual transmission Lamborghini Murcielago LP640. And, you know, I had sold a handful of them at the dealership, but I always knew that they were harder to find than it seemed like they would be. And so, you know, nobody had good metrics and the factory even didn't have good production data on exactly how rare the cars were. We assumed that they were about a 90 to 95 percent take rate on the single clutch sequential paddle shift transmissions. That's what Ferrari always said. That's what Lamborghini always said. But it turns out that wasn't true at all. It was more like 99 percent were paddle shifts. And so I started to build a list of the VINs, of the cars, and documenting the empirical rarity of the cars made them massively increase in value. I made a lot of money through it. And uh, certainly it, it made everybody else appreciate something that I already 
loved very deeply. And so combining those two things and how we document a car, how we connect cars together, not just to owners, but to each other is really where the VinWiki app came from. And in that first year, we grew to about 5,000 users because we think you're going to create this amazing social experience and people are going to tell all their friends and a butterfly is going to flap its wings in Kansas and all the dominoes will fall and you'll be, you know, Elon Musk. And that's unfortunately not true at all. So we had to figure out a way to market and that led us to YouTube. Yeah. And um, you guys have certainly done an amazing job of that. Not only do you have some absolutely amazing car stories, but the people that you've gathered and had on your channel, you have Rabbit, you have Travis, John Tamarian. I mean, you, you can't beat it. Oh, you, yeah. it's, a, it's kind of the dream team. And even one of Ohio's own, you know, Doug Tabbitt's on there all the time. And he's, a, he's quite the car fishing out on himself. That's it. And that's the thing. You know, when you spend enough time around cars, you come away with some incredible stories. And differently than the YouTube channels that are, that are about a single personality or a vlog type, type experience or even car reviews, the idea of really capturing and hopefully immortalizing some of the world's best car stories is really what the VinWiki channel is all about, because ultimately each of those stories represents a blown up, more theatrical version of something that would very appropriately be a post in the app. And so starting in late June 2017, I just got some pizza and beer and called a bunch of friends to the warehouse and said, let's sit around with some of this junk behind me and tell our best car stories. And uh, I had zero experience in like making videos or editing videos or anything like that. But I had a lot of friends that had YouTube channels that I'd met through the car business. I sold Rob Dom, his Diablo 6.0. I knew Rob Ferretti and Freddie Hernandez from his Jalopnik days and Doug DeMuro from college. And so it was just one of those things that I knew that there was an opportunity there. But even then, back in 2017, the opportunity wasn't nearly what it is today. And so you know, fortunately, it very immediately started to translate into meaningful users downloading and using our app. And, you know, before too terribly long, it started to uh, almost pay me the teacher's salary that my wife had at the time. So it was, it was a good thing. <laughs> One of the fun videos you have on your channel is how you almost bought a Bugatti. Now, is that still a huge aspiration for you? Is that kind of your next dream, like bucket list car, check off your list? Well, it's certainly the current white whale. But, you know, as somebody who has, you know, kind of done their professional life in order to finance their automotive life, and those have become more and more intertwined throughout my career, that goal is one of those things that gets you out of bed in the morning, is going out to buy your dream car. And in 2000, I guess it was 2014, I bought the first manual LP640, or I should say a bank I know bought it. And as long as I performed my duty towards them, they let me continue to drive it. And then as I was able to increase the values, a couple of years later, I was able to use uh, the profit in that car to buy the worst example of one, one that had been crashed by a drunk uh, son-in-law of an Iranian terrorist drug dealer in Canada. And so I had that car finally paid for. So it was the first time I'd really owned an exotic car without a gigantic loan attached to it. And so I really kind of had the dream. And I was, I, I had uh, honestly a kind of existential you know, work-life crisis of like, well, what's going to make me do this anymore? So almost arbitrarily, I decided to set the goal that I'd go buy a Bugatti because it seemed preposterous. And, you know, as the years have gone on and as the cars have become more valuable and as I've gotten more manual mercies, I, uh, I kind of got to the point where I could just about do it. But I haven't because I, I don't honestly like the cars more. I like them different and I like the goal of the cars. But last year, I found one that was an all carbon fiber orange interior super sport, which is considerably cooler than the early cars, which are still awesome. But, you know, they all have crazy maintenance and $25,000 tires and $20,000 oil changes and $250,000 transmissions that are occasionally prone to stop participating in mobility. And so I just kind of got to the point of like, I haven't bitten the bullet yet. I've tried awful hard. But I, I'm so happy to walk into my garage now and because I've got three mercies and uh I, I, I talked to Stradman about it. I was like, hey, man, I just got, I ended up doing this instead because I was chasing this other car. And he said, man, I, I'll tell you, I, you're, you're not wrong. The Mercies are still better, but maybe one day we'll add a Bugatti to the mix. Talking about the Mercy Lagos, there's 20 ish something manual cars in the, in the continental United States. How many have changed hands through you? Oh, well, that's a, I'd have to do some tabulation, but yeah, there's 23 LP640 coupe manuals in the U.S. and there's 10 roadsters. And so right now I've got the worst of each of those uh, in my garage, which I couldn't be any happier about. I just passed 50,000 miles 
in the coupe, which makes it the highest mileage one in the country. Uh, but the, you know, I've, I think I've sold 10 or so, maybe a little more than that. Now, a lot of the earlier cars, the O2s and O3s were all manual. And then in 04, they brought in e-gear. The 04 to 06 cars are, uh, you know, probably more than 85% manual. And so they're all rare, but the LP640 variant was, was extra rare. And then even more than that, the SVs. And so we recently had a bounty hunt looking for a manual transmission SV, but there's only seven of them in the world. And so uh, no one was uh, decided to uh, take me up on that offer to uh, sell any of theirs, or at least nothing at any reasonable price whatsoever. And so, uh, yeah, they're my favorite cars. I think they're everything usable about more recent exotic cars and they're everything that's awesome about the Countach on the put on the wall and so i uh to me it just doesn't get any better owning a supercar is kind of crazy because you know you'd mentioned the maintenance earlier it's not like buying a 69 camaro or a slip bumper and i rock like once that car is done you can kind of drive it and it's fine but if you have to put a timing chain in your small block chevy you know you don't have to pull the whole engine out to do it and it doesn't cost 30 grand. So can you touch a little bit on what it's like to, you know, do supercar maintenance? Yeah. So it's interesting because, you know, I was able to approach it from the rental side where we had a tremendous amount of failures and maintenance and then into the dealership side. And then now, you know, just kind of owning the cars and using them personally. And obviously the stories that come from that. And, you know, it's such a variable thing because when, when we were growing up, there were a lot fewer exotic cars. And so, in the 90s and even into the 2000s, like production wasn't anywhere near the number, the, the, what we see today. So Porsche, McLaren, Lamborghini, Ferrari weren't building nearly the number of cars that they are. And initially, that started to make them extremely reliable cars. So when you look at Gallardos and 430s and a lot of these cars from that kind of 2005 to 2015 range, they are wonderful and literally just about as reliable as anything you want. There was a lot of part sharing, especially in the Volkswagen, Audi, Lamborghini group stuff. And so honestly, those are cars you could drive 200,000 miles. And we've seen sometimes people to do that. As they've gotten even more technological, it almost seems like some of the manufacturers are out over their skis a little bit just because it is a little bit more common for us to have these double clutch transmission fails or these rudimentary all wheel drive systems or rear wheel steering and some of the stuff that probably never belonged on a car of that caliber uh, that do get super duper expensive to fix. And so that's one of the things that uh, we're almost going a little bit on the other side of the pendulum. They got really affordable and now they're a little bit too crazy. But um, honestly, you know, one thing I talk about all the time, like I, I, I don't have a ton of money. I just have no sensitivity to risk and wonderful credit. And I've had a lot of success flipping cars. And so I, I people can own these cars a lot more reasonably than they would assume. And that's why you see 50 times as many of them on the road today as you did 20 years ago. I recently visited Southern California and I'm just like, oh my gosh, there's, there's a G-Wagon and there's a G-Wagon and then a 435. And I'm just like, it would be cool to live somewhere warm like this. Yeah. You're never convinced me to go live somewhere where I had to park them for months out of the year. I mean, if I uh, park one, it's because it don't work or we're waiting on a part that doesn't exist just yet. Now you've had some other cool examples of the car. Like you bought that six by six Land Rover. That's, um, and I learned something new with that. I didn't realize that was a factory production vehicle, which is absolutely insane <laughs> sort of it was more of a collaboration that was factory endorsed so they wanted to build some like fire engines and you know special use vehicles other commercial vehicles and so they would outsource it you know done kind of under the factory umbrella and so it's it was a, a ridiculous vehicle i don't know that i've ever honestly driven something anywhere that gets more attention than that car which is pretty preposterous when you think about fluorescent colored lamborghinis but Man, everybody loves it. Everybody thumbs up everywhere. And, you know, absolutely worthless car from a utility perspective, but it's just so cool and everybody loves it. Oh, uh, parking it has to be quite the nightmare. It is smaller than it looks. Uh, so, for instance, one of the production cars that we use for Car Trek is a TRX, and it's about the same length as a TRX. Um, and so it's, you know, and it's narrower than a TRX, but it's not quite, and it's a little taller with the roof rack on it. But, it does actually fit places, um, less so off-road than on-road, but, uh, you know, that's what it's for is to go around some beach town and have the coolest thing anybody's ever seen. So speaking, you brought up Car Trek. Let's talk a little bit about that. And that's a, that's a whole other shebang you're involved in, which is really neat as well. So 
You guys are on series. Is it nine or ten? Ten. We just finished. Ten was the Land Rover. Uh, so yeah, we've done ten of them in the last three years, which is is really wild to look back on because you know, as automotive adventures go, it's it's sometimes you don't realize what an adventure it was until you're well past it. And by the time we were past it, we were already doing another one. So every time we're together, you know, Tyler will say something about, oh, uh, you know, remember that thing that your car did? And I'll be honestly, I, I didn't until you just said it. I'm going to have to go back and watch them all again just to uh, to remember how insane it all was. But, you know, that was really a response to not only the camaraderie that I have with Tyler Hoover of Hoovies Garage, but also Freddie Hernandez, Tavarish, who are other great YouTubers and, and make some incredible content. But uh, Freddie was over actually on his way to deliver the Pimp My Ride van to uh, Tyler up in Wichita as a Christmas present. And we were sitting around the fire at my house just talking about the business, talking about ideas. And I was like, you know, why don't we do something bigger? Like, I feel like we, as stewards of our audience's attention, I, I sort of feel like we owe it to them to up the ante, to take it to that next level if we have the ability to. And I know we don't know what we are doing, but how hard can it be? And so if you ask us, you know, kind of what if a sponsor comes to us, and this is exactly what happened, is we said, hey, could we partner with you, Auto Tempest, and the Ticket Clinic to produce something that's more cable-like? And they were like, do you have any idea what it's going to be? Like, not really, but if, if you're going to ask us, it's going to be us playing Top Gear on a budget. And they said, that sounds lovely. So we went out and tried, and, you know, it, it didn't fail which was the most surprising thing so far in my YouTube career, if you want to call it that. And, it, you know, it's not that we did the same thing or even pulled off, you know, a facsimile of what they did, but we were able to sort of pay an homage and a tribute to our favorite motoring program, just in the buy a terrible car for a challenge sort of way. We're not out reviewing new cars. We don't have our personal test track or anything like that, but we can come up with a ridiculous premise buy cars that sort of fit that premise and go on some stupid adventure and see what happens. And that's exactly what we've now done 10 times. Yes. And it's been fantastic. My personal, you know, I do like the first series buy the cheapest exotic car you can find. And, you know, we're going to do fun stuff with this. And that, like I said, I, I could watch those ones over and over. I think it's absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it, it is more fun than it looks like. I can assure you it's, it's, it's a weird thing to sort of have cameras along on your, you know, car guy adventure drives, but at the same time, you know, it, it does mean so much more when you're able to put them in such a ridiculous context. Yeah, we started with cheap exotic cars for the price of the C8 Corvette. Then we did the most appreciated supercars. Then we did Secret Santa Christmas Special, the most unreliable cars on earth, giving them to each other. Then we did Ferraris for the price of a Camry. Then we did a, a drive in our dream cars where we also had to rebuy our first cars. That's where we got to drive a McLaren F1 as well. And I got to race a fighter jet in the 765 LT. Then we did a $30,000 three-car dream garage. Gas guzzlers for the price of a Model 3. Recently importable cars, cars that were just 25 years old. And then uh, supercars for the price of a new Z06. And then terrible off-roaders on the Oregon Trail. So, uh, yeah. So, other than the Mercies... What is your favorite thing or the weirdest thing you owned? I know you've been where a big hand, you like the hammers, which I think them hammer cars are super cool. Honestly, uh, last year I bought a Spiker from Missy Elliott. And when you think of weird, awesome cars, the Dutch know how to do that awful well. And it's got a ton of really, really cool features that you don't find anything else that exposed gear linkage and the floor hinge pedals and the louvered fenders and the hood scoop and the inboard push rod suspension and the center lock wheels that are always over torqued. And it's all hand-built plus a bunch of Audi stuff that's reasonably maintainable. So I just drove that car about a 1,000 miles to Amelia Island and back for their Concours. And, of course, it was in the pouring rain, and it was the least watertight vehicle I've ever you know been in that actually had a roof. But uh, I had an absolute blast in that car. And compared, you know, for anything under a million dollars, nothing gets the attention that that thing does with all the aircraft polished aluminum and the turned aluminum dash and all the aircraft switches. And you just never see another one because – you know, I don't know that there's a company that could have missed time to the market any worse than what Spiker did. And obviously nobody appreciates rarity while you could still order a new one. But they only ended up selling about 260, 270 cars worldwide from 05 to 2010. And then they went bankrupt and then they bought Saab and then they went bankrupt again. And so, you know, it's just a, an amazing manufacturer history. And the cars are so, so distinctive and special to drive that, uh, I love that. I mean, obviously, I love something you're not going to pull up next to on the highway, but uh, I also love something that gives you such a weird and unique driving experience that if you just take it somewhere on a normal drive, which I do all the time, 
it makes that feel a lot more special. And the Mercies do that well, but, you know, there was a spot in the garage and Missy wanted out of it. Now, speaking of owning celebrity cars, so you've owned Missy Elliott's Spiker, the Paris Hilton SLR. So those cars are very, very noticeable. And then, you know, you were trying to hunt down El Chapo's. That was a was F1, correct? Correct. Yeah, we've sort of been on the hunt for that car for about three years as well. And I, uh, I, to me, the ultimate car, not that you really dream about owning $20 million cars, but uh, it, it would be an F1 and certainly it would be the worst one. And so uh, not El Chapo himself, but El Chapo's biggest drug runner, a guy named, uh, I think it's El Robashivas or something like that. It means the goat thief, uh, <laughs> had a brown over red with gold wheels McLaren F1. It's chassis 39, and it, it might have been given to him by some European clients. It might have been payment for something they received in return, but it, uh, it sort of disappeared into Mexico, still wearing its UK license plates, and Um, there's a few pictures of it from around 97, 98. And apparently it was supposed to be a a car built for a factory employee that his wife hated the color combination on. So he ended up taking a silver car. And, you know, when McLaren F1s were new, they were unsellable. I mean, nobody wanted to spend a a million to a million and a half dollars, depending on the exchange rate, uh, on, on whatever the car was, even though it was the fastest thing in the world. And so, um, I, we learned about that car a bit and I had some people tell me that it might be available. Uh, turns out that's absolutely not the case, but uh, the uh, the owner was killed uh, a year or two after he received the car, and when he died, he had not told anyone where the keys were, and so they ended up like trying to push it out, and they like, hid it in the barn for a while, and I have heard a hundred different rumors, none of which were substantiated by pictures or videos or anything like that, but it's a uh, it, it's still out there somewhere. Maybe it's in Saudi Arabia, maybe it's in the UK, maybe it's in Mexico. Maybe the guy's son got killed in it last week. Um, I've heard all of those are rumors that have come across my desk. You said they lost the keys. That's not a car you call your locksmith and be like, hey, I need a key. This is not a 1998 Chevy. There's, um, I imagine getting a key for it's a, a little harder. Uh, in fact, I heard they called the factory to ask for a new key, and the quote was $250,000, which if in, ni- in the late 90s, that's about what the car was worth. They, they, they seem to have found another way. I talked to a guy who claimed he'd been kind of like smuggled down there from Texas to do some ceramic coatings for the cartel and some armored G wagons. And while driving around, he says he saw it. I I don't know if that's true or not. He wasn't, he didn't have his phone with him. Didn't take a picture, but maybe one day. Now you've always been more of a European guy. Have you ever had any classic American muscle or anything like that? Not really, to be honest. Like I said, I've chased so many European cars and that's always kind of been the wheelhouse. Uh, I have owned very few American cars. We bought a Cadillac limousine for a while to race. Uh, but yeah, most of it's all been uh, been the European stuff. But uh, hey, you can't go wrong with either. Any future kind of fun plans you can uh, tell us about or anything like that? No, we've had some great storytellers come in recently and tell some amazing stuff. So those are going to come out in the coming weeks. And, you know, I've, I've usually got a backlog of about 100 videos shot ready to be edited. So it uh, can sometimes take a little while for those to churn through. You know, we're also experimenting, like most content creators, with short-form content, trying to release stuff to TikTok and to in YouTube Shorts and Reels and stuff like that. So I think that's certainly going to be the uh, the platform experimentation of the year. But uh, we were looking at several different premises for Car Trek 11. We burn ourselves out a little bit on it in three years, so we're uh, taking a little bit of a break in terms of time. But it, it we'll certainly be back to do that. Um, You know, in terms of project cars, I'm chasing a few cars overseas right now. We'll see if anything comes to fruition, but there's always something on the horizon there. But honestly, you know, I've uh, I've got two young kids. And so it's a little bit of business as usual this year. There's a couple of big, big picture goals, but I'm not sure that they'll all uh, find their finish lines this year. But we're certainly experimenting with some stuff with some sponsors and trying to figure out what's next. So speaking of chasing down some cars, what's it like to import a exotic car versus kind of your run of the mill deal? Oh, there's always special, but uh, I've I, in the last couple of years I brought in three cars. One was a TVR Cerbera from the Max Power era, sort of the pimp my ride of the UK, you know, hero car, uh, and we used that for Car Trek Seven. Uh, that one was quite easy because it's 25 years old. Uh, it just didn't run very well. So whenever you're kind of putting a car like that into so many uninformed and uh, unsympathetic hands, uh, it doesn't quite arrive in the condition you hoped it might. But 
we got it here and we even got it to uh, uh amelia island and back but uh, that car is now uh in a great collection of weird cars that it certainly deserves and uh the rover came in from uh, an art dealer in paris again over 25 years old so that was quite easy um the my mercy sv was a u.s car that was crashed sold through copart to a buyer in uh i believe poland is where it originally went if not hungary and then it was rebuilt and then i bought it from an austrian guy through a german dealer since that was a u.s car it was fairly easy to get it back in legally but because it was a salvage title car you've got a lot of competing qualifications for titling and registration so that car probably took me 40 or 50 hours of DMV appointments and different things that I had to do to ultimately get the car titled, even though customs clearance was by far the easiest for it. And so it's always its own set of problems, and it never goes exactly the way that you want. Uh, I get a lot of requests because we, we talk a lot about bringing cars in, about what that might require. And sometimes we talk about what would be the illegal ways to do that. And so I get a lot of questions about those as well, about disassembling cars overseas and shipping them over in boxes and putting them back together and getting mechanics lean titles and whatever. But uh, ultimately I, we've all done it the, as much on the up and up as can be. Uh, but yeah, we're chasing a few things that haven't come in yet, but we'll see if we can find a way. Yeah. And that's crazy how some of those, I guess, stories happen and shake out. Like there's, you know, one that sticks out to me is that is the illegal Koenigsegg. That is an interesting phenomenon that you see in a lot of these ultra high duty countries. So, you know, some of these countries have 150 to 200 percent duties on importing cars. And it can be cheaper to bring your car in illegally, get it seized on purpose, wait for them to auction it off. They auction it off as a legal car and you own it for less money than if you paid all the taxes in the first place. So, you know, you, you don't expect no corruption, but you also don't expect quite that much. And so it's, um, we've run into some really, really strange circumstances lately. There's so many cool stories that you guys have put out on VinWiki, especially with, you know, yours are, I enjoy yours, especially, you know, you used your app to, you know, track down a car and hand down, hand the cops some great information on a silver platter i I love that story that that one yeah that was a wild one yeah we just we found a car with a weird vin that wasn't complete and then figured out how to prove it was the car we already thought it was and so sometimes it works out really really well and and sometimes it doesn't yeah we have found a lot of stolen cars and our app users have as well i mean you know if a car is used in the commission of a crime and there's a shot of it in a newspaper with a license plate five minutes later somebody's going to have posted it to the VinWiki app and so I love that the type of information that you could discover about a car's past from the VinWiki app is so different than what you might find on Carfax or AutoCheck or just by Googling the VIN. And so we hope that it continues to mature into even more of a resource like that, where the weird things that happen to cars, they show up on VinWiki and they kind of overlay with whatever other automotive data sets we can have. and, uh, And you get to really see the clearer picture of where it's been. With VinWiki, just for the people at home that haven't, you know, used the app or anything, is it hard to get started? No, and it's all free. You know, whenever you're dealing with with a, you know, primarily crowdsourced information or a social app, it's best to keep it that way for as long as you can. And right now, fortunately, the YouTube channel pays enough to keep the servers spinning. So it's all y'all's to play with. But uh, we've got about 500,000 users in it now. We've got about 160 million cars in the database, about 10 million or so user posts. But the most interesting thing is the, is our list feature. So we, we allow people to make a list of like the cars that they've owned or the cars they've worked on in their shop or a specific registry of a rare car. And so we've got almost 10 billion connections of cars between those lists, which is super duper cool. And so uh, it, I'll be honest with you, it's not the easiest app to figure out what we're talking about once you download it. But uh, as you watch the videos and things like that, it becomes hopefully a little bit more clear. But ultimately, you're just posting information about a car to its VIN or to its license plate, and then we'll do the rest. I never had known so much about how these cars are optioned out and how rare certain options can make these things, like carbon brakes and you know things of that nature. And you know, just using the app, I've been able to learn, and that's kind of cool. Like I, I enjoy seeing that side of it. Well, and that's something we get to borrow from the muscle car world because you know, for all of those cars. There have been people who dedicated themselves to sometimes with and sometimes without factory support, figuring out how to decode the VINs, even if they're short, you know, pre-1981, non-17-digit VINs. 
they, they figured out how to say, all right, this is the color, this is the build date, this is the transmission, this is the engine, so that they could really just look at the serial number of a car and tell you what it was. And that's not usually very easy with modern exotics, but with enough research, you can usually figure it out. And so certainly that was a trend or an idea from the, uh, from the muscle car guys and, you know, hopefully turned into something a little more modern. But fortunately, we have a lot of them on the VinWiki app using their same strategies to, uh, to document their own cars. When it comes to what you're collecting, is there a time frame where it goes from, you know, nice, new, shiny to collector? That's difficult to say. You know, I've always tried, used the phrase, I like to look like I won the lottery 10 years ago. Uh, but I, uh, have kind of gotten to the point, I guess I've been saying that for 10 years, so maybe it's 15 or 20 years ago, uh, at this point, but you know, that's where cars usually stop depreciating. And so when I think about, you know, the economics of car ownership and the things that I like to avoid, my greatest fear is not, not to walk by my garage and see a bunch of broken stuff that needs a lot of attention, but to see a car that I know is worth less than it was yesterday is like the scariest thing in the whole wide world and something I, I could never tolerate. Like I might be driving a, you know, several hundred thousand dollar Lamborghini that I own for nothing through trading a bunch of stuff. And, but if I see somebody in like a new BMW, I'm like, man, that guy is rich. Look at that guy. He's got a new car. Cause I, that's just something that I've never, ever been able to like personally stomach. Uh, and so it's, uh, I don't know when it becomes like a collector car. It becomes a collector car when people realize that it's rare enough that they, you know, or significant enough that, that they, they chase it for more than what it is as a car. Maybe that's the definition. It's the one that came to my head in the last eight seconds. But I think that, you know, there's a, you know, I don't really like to buy cars because they're collectible. I like to use collectability as a hedge from a value perspective to buy the cars that I wanted to anyway. I, I like that. That's a great way to look at it. And you're, you have, have to have a really cool wife to be, you know, kind of on That's board right. with some of, some of this wildness. I know I don't want to give away all the, you know, the beans and potatoes, but one of your videos, you were, it was your wedding day and you were waiting on a phone call and you're like, do I pick this up in the middle of my ceremony? And that's, uh, that's, that's kind of funny. Definitely the craziest car I, yeah, I ever had. And, uh, what, uh, fortunately, uh, the marriage and the cars all had happy endings so far. Yeah. Th and that's all that matters. So yeah, exotic car rental business, you know, that was before working at the Lamborghini dealership and before VinWiki. That is the common theme. And yeah, so I started an exotic car rental company out of my dorm room at Georgia Tech back in 2006. And it's an idea that I'd kind of had in high school. And at the time, there really were not exotic car rental companies, at least not in secondary markets. So like, Gotham Dream Cars started about a year and a half before my company uh, out of New York City. There, were, there was one in the budget. Beverly Hills was known to have some exotics, and there was one in Miami. You know, now there's multiple exotic car rental companies in every major city. There's Turo everywhere, Haggerty's Driver Club, everything like that. So it was a very different time in the space, and it was a time in the uh, economic world that precipitated the downturn of 2008 where we had a thing called stated income loans. And that's what allows a 20 year old to buy a Lamborghini. And uh, not everybody paid their bills back then. I did so that I could keep buying more of them. But uh, yeah, I started with Lamborghini Gallardo, bought a Ferrari a few months later, another one uh, soon after that. And so I uh, had to kind of learn all of this and, and find insurance companies that could do it legally and build my own contracts and things. It was a lot less ironed out back then, but it was also a lot less competitive. And so like back then I knew that you know, I had to include 100 to 150 miles per day in a rental. And as I aggregated all the miles that we would put on, tens and tens of thousands of miles, it was costing like five and a half, almost $6 per mile to drive the cars all in by the time you accounted for depreciation and insurance and maintenance and consumables and all the things. And so I, um, I learned very quickly that my margins weren't very good and that if I couldn't charge you know, at least 1% of what the car was worth a day to rent it, I wasn't really going to be making any money. And so I go out and I look on Turo and see these $250,000 Huracans for rent for $500 a day. And I'm like, you are losing money. The yeah. best business outcome is for no one to ever contact you on this platform. <laughs> Turo is an automotive website for people who can't do math. <laughs> I love, I love that. Wait, would you do it again? 
you know, as you as you get later in your career and you've done more things, people always ask you, like, you know, what would you tell your younger self? And as much as I would say, like, you know, don't rent to this guy who's going to steal your car or don't rent to that guy who's going to crash it. In that business, you just have to have the emotional readiness that every time a car leaves, it's probably coming back on a tow truck not working. And so you can't get emotional about any of it, which is hard because all of your money and credit is tied up in it. But, you know, I, I was very happy that I did it at the time. I didn't make a ton of money. I certainly, you know, I was able to kind of sell the customer list off to a company that wanted to come into the Atlanta area and get out of the cars, kind of. Um, and, but at the end of the day, I learned so much. I came away with some great stories. I have made way more money on the stories from the car rental industry than I have on the, uh, the rentals themselves, which is a terrible, terrible thing and should rarely be the salvation of a poor business concept. But I am really, really glad that I did it. I made some amazing friendships and relationships through it, and it gave way to everything else that happened. And so today, no, I have zero temptation to go into that industry. <laughs> I do not recommend that anybody go into that industry. We have had to help so many rental car companies that have stolen cars because something you may not know is that if you steal a car that you've rented, it is not Grand Theft Auto. It is something called theft by conversion, and it is a civil suit for a very, very long time that might one day turn into a criminal suit. But if you take the car into a different state, even into a different county in most areas, the police don't care. They will not help the rental company get their car back. And we have uh, you know, recovered rental cars for companies that had you know, come from Tennessee and come into the Atlanta area. I found one on the 4th of July a couple of years ago. And it was in the middle of being torn apart. And with the help of some local law enforcement that had no jurisdiction whatsoever to do what they did, I was able to help have them help me convince the thieves to give me the car. And I didn't even work for the rental car company. Uh, but I just, uh, I was able to get it back. And since then, I, I'm on a group chat with a bunch of rental car companies. And literally every day, every single day of every year, someone tries to steal a car from one of them. And they, they swamp stories around. It's, it's nuts. So we've talked about it before, Ed. Um, where, where can the folks find you to check out your videos, your app? Um, you said you were making some TikToks as well. So just to kind of plug yourself there and let them know where to find you on the internet. Sure. Pretty much VinWiki or Ed Bolian on any of the platforms. Car Trek's over on Tavares's channel. So check those out. If you haven't seen them already, we'd love to make some more. And I think we certainly will sometime this year. But uh, we have an awful lot of fun. I, I try to be out at most of the big major events. Uh, I expect I'll be out at Car Week and SEMA and everywhere else and uh, certainly making my way into a summit sometime soon to find some parts. There are a handful of things that uh, that y'all have for my cars, too. Yeah, this this was a lot of fun. And we, we appreciate you taking the time to talk about kind of your cool life and some of your fun stories. So until next time, guys, I'm Justin with Summit Racing. We'll see you guys later. We have Ed here. Thanks again, Ed. And we can't wait to see what you put out in the future. Have a great day, everybody. This has been the On All Cylinders podcast. Powered by Summit Racing. Check out new episodes coming soon at onallcylinders.com. Onallcylinders.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.